So a lot of people have asked us uh, how they can talk to their school or church or company about critical race theory, how to approach these things, and they feel uh, a little overwhelmed by everything that could go wrong in this situation or what they should and should not mention. And we want to go over in this video a little bit, um, kind of a rough outline of how you might talk to your company, your school, or your church in, in these situations. And the first thing we want to say is that you don't necessarily need to talk to your company at this point. Right now, um, we are kind of in a holding pattern for some of this. I'm not saying don't speak out, but... A lot of this fight moving forward, uh, if um, there is a Joe Biden presidency, will take the form of lawsuits, and those lawsuits require hard evidence. So we'll have other videos diving deeply into what that evidence, lo evidence looks like, but first and foremost, it requires you to show up to these trainings and being collecting that evidence of discrimination and the things uh, a rough idea of what you're looking for is in Donald Trump's, Trump's executive order on race and sex stereotyping. If you go into that executive order, section 2A, 2B, and 2C would spell out the types of things that you'd be looking for uh, and trying to determine for violations. Also, anything that crosses into the political realm. So collecting that information and being patient, there's a lot you can do privately to fight back. Mm -hmm. But Let's dive into uh, a good guide that we kind of created here. We're going to drop down the description of things you might be able to talk, uh, questions you might ask, and uh, you can select some of these, uh, use all of them, reform it to fit your needs. And this could be multiple conversations or a, a mass email. So, yeah. And, and so if you do decide to go anonymously and to connect, uh, collect evidence, it could be anything from, you know, collecting the materials from trainings, email chains with your superiors, um, letters from HR or any authority figure within your church, school, or work, and then um, attending those trainings. If you can record the audio or video, that's, that's trainings, phenomenal. Materials. If not, just taking, you know, very meticulous notes. And an important note there, real quick, is mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of times you'll have recommended readings and recommended links, external mm -hmm. links. Most people aren't going to click on those or view those. Those could end up being the most important things because a lot of times that's where the craziest stuff will be hidden is saying, oh, go read this book or here's these, uh, this, this link for external resources. And then they'll have a big activist checklist, a mm -hmm. bunch of political actions, whatever it might be. So just keep an eye out for that. And we'll, we'll continue to kind of harp on this point as we move forward over the next months with, with these videos. And I, I, I want to really give you some hope because we know that it works when you stand up, whether it's anonymously writing letters to your HR or to your bosses or like on the KIPP website. They had a, a white people take action section and they also had an Asian people take action section. And that Asian section is no longer there. So I assume enough people in the community complained about it that it got taken down. Or we, or even, you know, you standing up at your workplace and working with Chris Rufo and Chris Rufo's articles and getting that pushed through. The White House did an executive order and we got that pushed out. So you taking these actions, you can have a phenomenal effect with inside your company. And we've had people reach out to yes. us from major companies that they've written letters to the CEOs of their HR divisions. They've written um, to the CEOs and presidents of their companies. And maybe they've heard back. Maybe they haven't. They're still waiting for feedback. But and they we also need to caveat a caveat that. So I recently posted up on Twitter um, asking somebody for um, the, the individual Peter... Isberg that we just interviewed, he had lost his job. He got fired for this. And it wasn't because of our call to action. But then someone commented and they were criticizing saying, this guy gets fired. And then he named me, um, Tim Pool, and a bunch of other individuals that tell people to stop being cowards and speak out. Essentially kind of criticizing. And I say, yeah, obviously, <laughs> the reason you need courage to speak out is because this guy did get fired. There's a risk. If there was no risk, then you wouldn't need courage. Mm -hmm. You would just speak out. And so... Don't think that it's all, uh, yes, we're saying you can make a difference. Also, you're taking a massive risk as well. So 
you need to do what you're comfortable with, but you, you also need to realize what the cost of inaction is. Which is ultimately and so be, why be we're fighting it. intelligent with actions it. you take. Yeah, well, it's ultimately why we're fighting it, right? Should, should any person be able to, or not be able to stand up for their ideology or to ask questions or to suggest a, a maybe an alternative solution to the disparities that exist or to any, any problem that exists, you being unable to just speak out about it or ask questions or just maybe exercise your basic first yeah. amendment rights or at, at work if you want a different hr training maybe something more effective you know just asking those questions if you get reprimanded or fired for asking those questions don't you think that's the bigger problem it's foreshadowing of a much darker future and it's a future that i don't think we want any of our children to live with mm -hmm. so Let's get into these questions here, and we thought, you know, pretty. We thought about these quite a bit, and put in the comments if you think there's something that we can add to these. This isn't this isn't some uh, final draft of any documents. So we're just kind of sharing our rough notes with you, but uh, any other ideas that we might have, this is going to be a continuing conversation, and we're going to continue to uh, push this moving forward as as we speak to our companies. Other people have come with good letters that they've written um, already written sent to their companies and they posted those publicly. So those are some things we might incorporate to show some other examples. Mm -hmm. So Okay, so uh, yeah, these are our notes here. Mm -hmm. Just rough notes here in one note. Okay. So the burden of proof is on your company, your church or your school. So you should be able to ask them these questions and receive answers back. And if they don't answer them, that's telling as well. You know, but, um, you and when we say the burden of proof is on them, what we're trying to say is you don't have to be an expert in, in debunking all of these arguments before you go to them. You have to, they have to realize that um, if they're going to present evidence, you don't necessarily be able to have to refute it right there. You're just gathering the, the information they're giving to you. If they answer these with what they say is facts and data, then just take that for what it is, uh, collect it, note it, and go research it. Right. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is determine who is in charge or where the CRT messaging is coming from. Did it come from the CEO? Did it come from the main pastor, the school board, you know, a, a politician, the HR division, the diversity, inclusion, and equity division, uh, any specific leader or administrator? And then you want to set up a meeting or a call with them. And sometimes that's a hard thing to do. So just uh, just because you can't handle all these steps, just do the best you can with them as and, you go and through if, this process. If you don't get a response to set up a call or a meeting, you can write the letter and ask all the questions. Write it to, you know, I don't know, blind carbon copy it to, to several individuals in your authority chain yeah. and see if anybody will respond to you. Um, so if you do call them or have a meeting with them, you want to be able to record the conversation somehow if possible, or just take meticulous notes. Um, and make sure, I, I want to emphasize that you be very empathetic and assume that they have good intentions and that they're not fully aware of the consequences of CRT and what CRT will bring to their company, their church, or their school. Because in reality, they were probably pressured by others in the leadership or HR, in somewhere in politics, within the community. There was community outrage. You know, after George, George Floyd, we were seeing that that's a significant trigger for a ton of HRs, corporate um, yeah. settings in churches and in schools. They saw that it is a green light to just go sh full force for CRT. Yeah, and then... Um, with the recording, that's something, that's a luxury that, you know, I necessarily didn't have with my company with all the security clearances and everything um, that that's a lot of it can, you know, easily get you fired. And for some things that, you know, if you record certain spaces, you, you can actually end up going to jail for some of that. But for anyone else, you know, just be mindful of you'll likely be recording in areas where you're going to get fired, but being fired at the end of the day is the worst thing in the world. Don't be installing some software to screen capture on your computer. That's stuff that your company might be able to see. But putting your right. camera off to the side during some conference and capturing your screen and making sure you don't have mm -hmm. any personally identifiable information or, you know, the edges of your computer or whatever in there, then that's a really good way that you can capture some information from those. But, you know, right. if you're just make sure you're being smart about it and Definitely. being safe with it as well. But certainly if you're dealing with any sort of, you know, security clearance and stuff, you, you never want to put those things at risk. So just For be sure. smart. Okay, so so maybe the person implementing this or at the head of your company, you know, merely caved to social pressure, you know, maybe in fear of cancel culture themselves. And so they were afraid to stand up against this. Maybe they don't they don't particularly believe in it, but they were called to action or, or demanded to action. Like even uh, the president of your company, um, he said, I 
I made the mistake of being an ally in words only, and I needed to be an ally in action only. So that that kind of phrasing makes you think that he probably had a lot of social pressure. And and um, so we'll go yeah. ahead. Sorry. No, okay. you're fine. So next, we want to ask them if they're aware of aware of the CRT uh, training and if they played a role in implementing the anti-racist, unconscious bias CRT training um, at, at your company, school, or church. Okay, and then ask how much do they support it? Do they have any objections to it? Are they open to other solutions for diversity trainings? Um, so if, if they're open to those things, then that's, that's a great conversation starter right there. So those are good first questions to ask. All right, you want to ask um, your company, school, or church leaders, or HR, if they believe that America is inherently racist and sexist, and if it's contributing to a white supremacy system. So this is CRT in a nutshell. So you want to get a base, a base feel if they believe in CRT. Okay, you want to ask them if American institutions are inherently racist, sexist, or contributing to a white supremacist system. We want to ask, are white individuals inherently racist, sexist, and contributing to a system of white supremacy, even if unconsciously or unknowingly. You get a, get a sense of their uh, views on unconscious bias. Um, ask, do they believe modern individuals are responsible for the crimes, sins, or misdeeds of past individuals based on race or gender? Um, do they believe all white individuals should feel guilty for slavery, Jim Crow, or any other past discriminations? Do you believe white individuals should be required to pay reparations to any historically disadvantaged group? Um, ask if they believe if any aspect of an individual's character can be determined by their race or sex. And then ask them if they believe any of the following traits are partially or wholly created by a particular race to oppress another race, like meritocracy, hard work ethic, rugged individualism, strict time schedules, planning for the future, delayed gratification, or the scientific method, or any other traits that are traditionally, that have traditionally been viewed as positive traits. And this is a lot of times um, not at the forefront of your critical uh, trainings, or, sorry, your critical theories type trainings, but this is kind of embedded down in a lot of their documents when you actually read the books that they recommend and, and go through the different videos like TED Talks and things like that. They'll, you'll get into all these things that we traditionally thought were good things, but in reality are just racist and oppressive. According to critical theories. Yes, yes, according to <laughs> okay. the critical theories. <laughs> So you also want to ask them um, if they believe minorities and historically disadvantaged people are less capable than all white people. Do you believe that it might be racist against both minorities and white individuals to stereotype any group of people based solely on their race or sex? And then ask, has your company, church, or school currently been found to be racist to minorities or other disadvantaged groups or individuals? And if so, if your church, company, or school has been found to do those things or your leader thinks that they have, ask them who. Ask them when it has happened and give them give you the specifics of the cases. Um, you really want to ask them if, if that's the case. Were white individuals disproportionately the offenders in those cases? And then if they have statistics or records to, to show this, to prove it to you. Because that's that's very important. Because it, if is if it is actually happening there, then that's something to address, and and then solutions can be found for that as well. Yeah, and obviously most of the time the answer to those are gonna be gonna be no. Yes. And if it was, you know, you'd be extremely surprised because these companies come out being uh, systemically racist or openly racist nowadays mm -hmm. is <laughs> means to be canceled, just socially and culturally canceled in general. Well, so. and I, I think something you could ask after that as well as if. If there have been any instances of discrimination against uh, an administrator, a student, a coworker, et cetera, like was there disciplinary action taken? Was there racial sensitivity training taken? Like were there correct, correct measures taken in those cases? And should the entirety of the workforce be exposed to these new trainings because of those one or two <laughs> or very specific scenarios that yeah. took place in the workplace? Um, so I, I, that's worthwhile, I guess. These trainings making your force more racist, just against white males, I suppose, or white people in general. <laughs> right, and that's that's when we get into the the next section. You want to look up uh, the discrimination and civil rights laws and, and violations at the federal level, the state level, and the city level. Yeah. 
And then um, you want to ask the leader that you're talking to if they feel that they are violating any of those laws by singling out and stereotyping slash scapegoating any group or individuals by their race and gender. And you you kind of, this is a kind of a, a little bit of a scare tactic, but mostly it's just a reality check. Because if they are discriminating against any group, be it white males or minorities or anyone in, in a workplace, a school or a church, then, then <laughs> they could be in trouble with the law. Yeah, in reality, we want to avoid the legal battle. That legal yes. battle is expensive and destructive and it's uh, embarrassing to these organizations. Mm-hmm. So if we can kind of subtly point out that this is a possibility in the future and we really need to look into these things, then hopefully we can kind of uh, de-escalate the situation before we get to that point right. and save everyone a lot of headache. And in, in a way, like you're doing these leaders a favor by being an advocate for them, looking out for them legally by saying, look, you know, you, you may want to to determine if you are on the right side of the law here and ask them again if they feel that they are violating any of these laws and then if a lawsuit was brought up by any of your employees your parish your congregation or your students would you feel strongly that you are in the right and would you win these legal battles and also it's it's the fact that you're talking about these legal battles um, you you want to avoid these legal battles at all costs, and a lot of these uh, well, they do CEOs, too. Yeah. yeah, they do too. But the the CEOs and individuals are actually looking for an out. A lot of times, there's many CEOs that feel like they're held hostage by this training, mm-hmm. and or maybe not CEOs, but managers, whoever you can talk to, that they will be able to use this and kind of look into that and say, oh yeah, I guess we are exposing ourselves legally. You know, now now I have leverage when I go to the HR department, these diversity, uh, inclusion and equity departments and talk to them about why we need to tone down the rhetoric and say, we're, you know, we're exposing ourselves to, you know, the following lawsuits. So I think that's important it, to not just assume that because it's being pushed in your organization, don't assume that your leadership is happy about it. Right. Many of these Or leaders, that they're all in on CRT because they probably aren't. They're probably unaware of the effects of it or it's full scope of what it means no they're unaware they can even push back they don't realize that the, a lot of them aren't even aware that yeah. some of these companies that have pushed back they've completely eliminated these trainings from their organizations they said if you're not happy with it leave there's the door and these organizations are thriving they're doing great and that's uh becoming a little more common now just in the past couple of weeks we had a couple of big organizations come out so mm-hmm. we should uh, cover those in the future because i think showing a path for how these companies can fight back from the corporate level down is important because there could be somebody listening to this video now that is a CEO saying, how do I get this out of my company? Right. So I think that's important as well. Yeah. So, so, so again, yeah, be, being empathetic and making sure that you're, you're, you're more an advocate looking out for them and, and your business, school, church, um, because that should be your mentality moving yeah, into this. Yeah, you should, you should be doing this whole That was party. certainly my mentality moving mm-hmm. into it with my company. I was trying to, you know, especially where we deal with national security and so critically important to to the country as a whole, I'm not going in there trying to take anyone down or do any gotcha moments. No. My greatest hope from the very get-go and even now is that we strengthen the company and benefit, you know, the, the national security interest. I'm, I'm not looking to put anyone in a bad situation. So I think it's important to take everything from that perspective. Definitely. Okay, and on and that note, you want to ask them if they are open to finding other solutions to solving, you know, the disparities that they're concerned with, you know, that don't include discrimination and stereotyping against any race or gender, right? So, so there are diversity trainings and inclusion trainings that are, that are perfectly fine, beneficial to the entirety of the workforce, the entirety of the student body, the parish, the congregation, whatever situation it is that you are in. Yes. And then um, if they are open to that, ask them if you can discuss it at a later time where you can, you know, come up with and present, you know, alternate solutions to those to those concerns that they have or, or brainstorm diversity or or um, there's a lot of different diversity groups that offer this kind of training and you could yeah. present that to them to even to your, your HR departments or your, your CEOs, pastors. And, and one thing I want to add to this is with the churches. The church is a little unique because this formula right here might not wholly work in that case because you have to appeal to these churches at the same level. Uh, typically your churches are all talking in the aspect of moral morals mm-hmm. and values and 
you can't just go in there and ask them these things and say, you open yourself up to legal battle or something. That's not really going to work. What you really have to do in a church is you actually have to dig down and come in with a genuine, um, a genuine wanting to understand what they what they are trying to teach, and then you have to be able to deconstruct that in their terms. I couldn't possibly tell you how to what type of moral appeals would work for your church, but we can go over in the future what would generally work for churches. You have to break it down really, really make them understand that what they are pushing, they they clearly have intentions that are good, but you actually have to break it down and show why their intended outcome is not what is not moral. What their intentions, their outcomes don't match. So that is another video in itself. Right. Really digging into appealing to the logic of maybe I mean, like a pastor or somebody. A, a really few ideas understand. though is if you're talking to your pastor and and he has a congregation that's mixed race or um, even majority white or it, but they've been appealed to CRT, they think it's morally justified. Yeah. You could ask them, do you believe that you're, you're white per, you know, congressman or what do you call them? Parishioners? <laughs> I don't know. The, the white individuals in your, your congregation, oh, yeah. do you believe that they have ill intent in their hearts and that they've been racist this whole time, that they're upholding a white supremacist system? You know, you put it in a, in a spiritual context, possibly, and say, do you believe that these people have you know, yeah. unconscious bias that they're unaware of. Is, is it your job to, I, I mean, I don't and know. And not to mention you going to them with path. a group of individuals, right? You're not the only one unhappy. And especially if you you find, we've had a lot of um, African-American individuals reach out to us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like the individuals that I wish would speak up at, at work rather than just reaching out to me in private. Um, and it's, it's a little more hard hitting for somebody that believes in this ideology to hear this coming from somebody who is a minority or you showing up with multiple individuals and showing that you're well-intentioned and saying, look, that might be your intention. That's our intention as well. A lot of our intentions align Mm -hmm. because if we actually go look at what they intend to do, like eliminating these disparities, I agree with them. And so you need to, you need to really make them understand that that's not what's happening. And you have the, the same goals. You just yeah. have different solutions to achieving those goals. And these, uh, we've had black people reaching out to us and other minorities talking, or and females as well, talking about how belittled they felt by this mm-hmm. and how demeaning it is and how uh, how hard it is to speak out about this on their front because they feel like, uh, you know, a lot of times they're called like a, a traitor to their race or gender, whatever it may be. Right. So getting them to sit down with you and going at it with a, a group rather than just one individual can be much stronger in those situations. So... All of these require a different level of, um, I guess, finesse when you're going into them, whether you're talking to your company or you're talking Mm -hmm. to a a school or if you're actually going into a church. So keep that in mind, and we're going to keep covering these. Please put any ideas you guys have down in the comments. Also, like and subscribe to this channel. This is um, going to be a hard channel to grow because they already have a shadow ban and demonetized <laughs> on almost all of our videos. They don't it's, like us I think we YouTube. hit record time on all of that. So us actually growing is going to be a very interesting thing moving forward, and I'm pretty horrible about asking people to subscribe and stuff because... I guess I haven't really cared up till recently. Oh. So just uh, let's do, do what you can with the uh, with sharing this. That's one thing that they can't they can't censor and suppress is, is sharing this video. I also wanted to say one quick thing about you could you could use this conversation starter as a base for individuals. If you know a, a coworker who is who is a true believer in CRT, have the conversation with them. You know the yes. the anti racists are always accusing us non believers of of not wanting to have conversations about race, to not wanting to have these awkward conversations. No, we just don't want to be accused of or our character attack for things that we're not responsible for and that, that aren't true, right? And so having this conversation with individuals who are true believers of CRT is also very beneficial. And you might create an ally um, where, where you didn't think one existed before as well. Yeah, and we we have uh, talked in the past about this a little bit, but I want to want to reiterate that when you go in and have these discussions and they want to present a bunch of evidence or data points to say why they believe this and why this is factual really pin them down on they can present a bunch of them say i just want you to select your strongest piece of evidence for a b c that way you walk out of the conversation with you know just a handful of things that are the hardest hitting to that individual Mm -hmm. that way if you actually go and do the research or even reach up somebody like us and say hey somebody claimed this is this true can you look into this for me when they're super strong claims and you can debunk those 
you actually start to shake what makes up the core beliefs of that individual. And, and after they feel, feel like they've been lied to, it kind of opens their eyes and they start that journey. And you might point them to some resources after that. Say, here's some other resources that can, you know, lead you down a better path and maybe present an alternative to what mm-hmm. you've been taught. It's, it's essential that they, that they understand that you're on common ground. You have common goals to solve disparities. You just have different solution ideas and that CRT is destructive and dangerous. Yeah, so um, just keep courage and stay strong out there. And we're all going to keep up the good fight and know that there's a lot of good stuff ahead regardless of what happens in politics. There is a bright future in this fight on our side of the fight. We have mm-hmm. facts and logic on our side.